Happy Friday, interwebs, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a weekly video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical advice along the way. I'm your host and security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 27th, 2014. I have very little time this week, so I'm not going to cover these stories in a ton of detail. If you want more detail, be sure to check the reference section in the blog post associated with this video. With that said, let's dive into this week's three security stories. For the first story, I actually want to combine two big security stories this week that have one thing in common, and that is kind of misleading security news. One of the big stories at the beginning of this week was news of another big uh, Russian state-sponsored, allegedly, attack campaign that was affecting uh, governments like Georgia uh, and other Eastern Bloc and European countries and governments. And this was all due to FireEye's APT28 report that really detailed this big, allegedly Russian uh, state-sponsored attack campaign. And it's a very interesting report, but it might sound familiar to you. You know why? Because over the last two weeks, I've been talking about Sandworm. Back during Microsoft Patch Week, I talked about Sandworm. It's when the iSight partners, the iSight security organization, released details about the allegedly Russian attack campaign that was targeting NATO and the Eastern Bloc organizations. APT28 is the same thing, and yet there's two 200, I'm exaggerating a bit, but a ton of new security stories detailing this fantastic new attack campaign. And it really, it's, not, it's the same thing as Sandworm, which we've been talking about in detail for the past two weeks now. So the point I'm making here is I remember back in the day when there used to be more consistent worms and viruses that broke the headlines. And back in those days, my biggest pet peeve was all these AV companies that had different names for the exact same threat. You know, one person would call this uh, joke bot, another person would call this Bob bot. You know, everyone made their own marketing name for the exact same threat. And this is stupid. This confuses uh, the victims out there. This confuses the security industry. So I'm kind of a little bit irritated by this APT28 report. It seems more like marketing. Somebody seeing all the news that Sandworm is getting and trying to jump in the entire game. That said, I will say FireEye's APT28 report is a lot more detailed than the, the iSight's report in my personal opinion. So I'll post a link to it. The most important part is they have a lot of indicators of compromise, things like IPs and hashes and things you might use to help protect your network. But I am a a little irritated that two separate companies call the same attack campaign something different. It's kind of misleading and created some misleading headlines in my personal opinion. Another story around misleading headlines was a big hoopla about the FBI hijacking the Seattle Times. There was a lot of stories about how the Seattle Times is up in arms and the security industry is up in arms uh, and really mad that it turns out that back into 2007, the FBI used Seattle Times' name in order to nab a criminal. And many of the headlines made it kind of seem like there was a malicious Seattle Times article out there. And they kind of hinted that it was a public article maybe on the Seattle Times page. This is not at all true. Here's what happened in 2007. The FBI identified a MySpace page associated with a suspected uh, 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 bomb threat person. And they wanted to know who this person really is. So they sent one MySpace message to him, only to him, and the MySpace message pretended to be a Seattle Times article about this particular bomb threat case with a link to it for him to click on. Now the link did not go near Seattle Times. There is never any article on Seattle Times or in Reuters. This was all in one fake message directly to this one single person. Now when he did click on that link, they actually did hijack his computer. It was a, a phishing link. They actually have a law enforcement tool, which is essentially good guy malware, to hijack his computer and they figured out who he was. And now that this story has come public, Seattle Times is upset about it. But really, uh, what a lot of these stories seem to be focusing on is people are worried that they use Seattle Times to infect this guy and maybe a lot of people were exposed to this. Only this criminal was exposed. This was never an article on Seattle Times' page. This was one MySpace message sent only to him. 
So what's my point here? Well, really, I like the fact that the mass media has picked up on cybersecurity. I like that there's more articles about security risks that can help make people aware and help protect themselves. However, a lot of the articles I've seen lately have been going over the line and turning into FUD or misinformation, and really that has to stop. I know you have to write a catchy headline, but uh, we need to make security news very factual and less FUDy. Let's move on to the second story, and this one's probably more relevant to people out there, at least the folks that run industrial control systems. This week, U.S. Sort sent an advisory warning about the Black Energy malware campaign, or attack campaign. And while Black Energy is an attack campaign that's been around for two years, it's changed recently. And basically, this U.S. Sort advisory said that they're aware of many industrial control facilities, unnamed ones, so we don't know who, who have been affected by this particular malware malware and this attack campaign. And this is malware, by the way, that targets human machine interfaces. In industrial control organizations, like when you have manufacturing plants, water sewage treatment plants, oil refineries, those sorts of things, you have special human machine interface software that connects to all the different controllers in your plant or facility to kind of give you a heads up information about what's going on. And this comes from many different vendors, GE, Simmons, uh, many, many vendors make this type of very proprietary industrial controller SCADA software. In any case, the US CERT uh, report identifies some specific pieces of software that this malware targets and takes advantage of vulnerabilities in. And they talk about how this malware has has successfully infected some industrial control facilities. Now the good news to you out there is the malware doesn't seem to be damaging. Right now this seems to be the reconnaissance and enumeration phase of the malware. It uh, pays attention to what's going on in the HMI, it gives the bad guys uh, the way to exfiltrate data, but it's not actually trying to break any processes yet. But it's just a very interesting story and it's a wake-up call on the change in the threat landscape. There are more sophisticated actors now that are going after industrial control facilities. The Internet of Things, all these computer devices that are kind of stealth computers that are all over the place. So the takeaway here is if you run any sort of industrial control stuff, you should probably check out this Black Energy US CERT report. It's very interesting reading. And by the way, if you're just a normal organization, this, this Black Energy campaign shouldn't concern you, but it should make you think about the Internet of Things. Normal organizations are going to start having more and more devices that don't look like normal computers but are connected to computer networks and have sensors controllers. Those need to be protected as well as they continue to grow on everybody's networks. For the last and I think most interesting story this week, I want to talk about a malicious Tor exit node. Uh, a couple months ago, I was talking about a researcher who found a way to inject malicious code into a file or binary as it's traveling over a network. If he can do a man-in-the-middle attack between you and some place you're downloading a file, he can actually dynamically inject code into that file so that uh, if it's a program, it will still run or install, but it will also have some evil code attached to it as well. In any case, this particular researcher released a, a toolkit for doing this. It was called the Backdoor Factory, and you can find it on GitHub. But this story is more about a blog post he just put on his Leviathan Security blog. Essentially, he decided to search the Tor network where he suspected this sort of attack was happening. And Tor is the anonymizing network. It uses peer-to-peer -peer capabilities and, and, and people's uh, volunteer exit nodes to make your traffic appear to come from somewhere else. And there's lots and lots of Tor exit nodes, places in different countries that your traffic appears to come from. What he found when he tested about 1,600 or so, I forget the number, exit nodes, he found one exit node that was actually dynamically changing and manipulating binary or executable files. As you're going through these anonymizing peer-to-peer -peer hosts, somebody else has access to the route your network traffic goes through. So if they can do this sort of man-in-the-middle attack, they can inject all kinds of things into your binaries. They can do all kinds of nasty things to your, your traffic once they're, they're part of the route you go through to get to the internet. So it's a pretty concerning report. So I'll post a link to his blog post that shares some evidence, technical evidence, that led him to this conclusion. In any case, you might want to know how to protect yourself. Anytime you're downloading software from a, a, any source, or, or especially an unknown source, you really want to check the validity of the file that you downloaded. A lot of places you download files offer checksums, MD5, SHA-1, or SHA-2 checksums that you can then use to verify that the file you actually got matched the file before 
where you downloaded it. So you should definitely use those. Also, the software makers out there are actually starting to incorporate checksums in their installers. So they will self-validate themselves as they're installing and will tell you if anything's changed. I hope more and more software developers use this automatic validation in the future. In any case, it's just a fascinating story, so be sure to check out the blog post. Well, that's all for this week. I'm totally out of time. Ton of other stories as usual. Check out the reference section. You can, of course, find that on the WatchGuard Security Center blog. I recommend you visit that regularly. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept or follow WatchGuard at WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching. And here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank you.